Hello and welcome to our webinar designed to provide prospectus from Barbados, Captive's solutions for a dynamic market in 2021. I am Renata Mohammed, Director of Investment and Marketing, Invest Barbados. Apologies on behalf of our CEO, Kian Brathwit, for her absence. She is with the team in Dubai as Barbados prepares to join the world at Expo 2020 Dubai. Our theme at that expo aptly communicates our story from sugarcane to blockchain. It speaks to the strides that we have taken as an island over the years. And while we are known for giving the world some of its finest rums from that very same sugarcane, and our image is one of sun, sea, and sand, Know too that Barbados has been attracting international companies to its shores for decades and remains ranked among the top 10 captive domiciles in the world. How has a small island in the Eastern Caribbean maintained this rank? We are home to an expanding roster of businesses of substance. We are known for our competitive costs and an effectively regulated business environment with modern corporate laws reasonable solvency requirements, and an expanding treaty network. In recognition of our offering, Barbados is listed as second for competitiveness among the Latin American and Caribbean countries in the 29th edition of the Global Financial Centers Index, a well-earned position. Supportive of our existing investors and cognizant of the needs of those considering Barbados, the government of Barbados remains steadfast in its commitment to ensuring a stable, wholesome, and facilitative environment for discerning investors. As a national investment promotional agency of Barbados, know that the team at Invest Barbados is available to be your guides. A warm and welcoming investment climate awaits. Today, our expert panel of speakers, to whom we are grateful, will tell you more while engaging us in what promises to be an insightful discussion, albeit today minus video. We do apologize. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the session. We now pass over to our moderator, Darren Treasure. Darren? Thank you, Renata. My pleasure to join today as moderator. Uh, I'd like to introduce the esteemed panelists today. We have Justin Cole, Vice President Management Services at DGM Captive Management, Nicholas Critchlow, Senior Vice President Marsh Management Services, Barbados, Gabriel Hol Holschneider, CEO and Founder, Rainmaker Group. So today's discussion, we're going to give you some perspective on Barbados um, in the current dynamic market, um, as we've all been well aware and heard many times the the insurance market is going through a hard market cycle you know we've had the pandemic there's new risks emerging so all of these things um, are, are pertinent to Barbados and we'll try to um, share some knowledge with you in terms of how Barbados can be a jurisdiction for captive solutions so first off I'd like to kind of start with an icebreaker a, a, a little insurance joke for the crowd here just to get everyone loosened up um, so what's the similarity between a parachute and insurance? If it doesn't work the first time you need it, it's useless. That kind of speaks to the planning required when you're setting up a captive. There just needs to be a lot of planning, assessment, feasibility, studies conducted before you choose your jurisdiction and move ahead with a captive solution. So the first area we'd like to kick off with is to talk about Barbados as a domicile and what are some of the considerations 
that pers prospective captive owners may want to look at or consider. So to kick that off, I'd like to introduce Justin Cole to speak about Barbados and some of the domicile considerations. Go ahead, Justin. Hi, Darren. Thanks for the introduction. Um, actually, stemming from Darren's joke about uh, the importance of planning and getting it right, obviously in determining and selecting a domicile um, for your captive, that is one of the major considerations for all um, prospective captive owners and something that a lot of thought and effort needs to be put into. Um, there are a wide range of factors that um, you know can make one domicile more appealing than another, and there are quite a few choices out there. So let me just talk a bit more about Barbados and various things to consider. And I know Renata touched on a little of on some of these items. Um, one, stability, which is of course needed. Uh, captives are very long term uh, for planning, and Barbados has a long history of political, social, and economic stability. Um, even with the COVID crisis, you would have noticed the nation very much united. And in chatting with the other panelists um, before the session got started, Gabe actually talked about the, the smooth process and the measures in place in Barbados um, that you know allowed Barbados to remain open, but yet still a safe place. Another important consideration is, uh, and I'll kind of group these together, which is reputation, robust regulation, and governance. Barbados has been in the insurance sector for almost 40 years and is one of the top 10 captive insurance domiciles worldwide. So we've been around for a while, we have a track record to prove it. And establishing your captive in Barbados allows you to put that brand name behind your company. You know, it's a name that will be recognized. The regulator applies a risk-based approach, which results in Barbados being a high quality jurisdiction, but it's also right-sized in that, you know, you don't have excessive requirements for maybe a smaller captive where it kind of doesn't make sense. Um, in addition, the country does have low capital requirements and as well as flexible solvency requirements. Barbados also has focused on double taxation agreements and bilateral investment treaties. And compared to our other Caribbean jurisdictions, um, we have a much wider network than them. And a lot of them actually have tax information exchange treaties in place which um, with partners like CAD are just not uh, quite the same and don't have the, the full range of benefits and protections. Uh, so we do have a, a great advantage here in terms of the treaty network. Um, there's no capital gains tax in Barbados. The tax rate for class one licensees is 0% and class two licensees is 2%. In addition, um, another great advantage, and to be honest, this is one of them, um, the stronger ones, in my opinion, is the workforce. Um, Barbados has a larger population than our other Caribbean neighbors, and we also have a very highly educated and skilled workforce. What this means is that um, when you set up your captive here, most of the employees or the captive managers are actually local. They are from Barbados. And for your captive, this means that they're here for the long term. Uh, me, myself, I'm born and raised in Barbados. And you know, my plans are to remain in Barbados. So, you know, if you set up your captive now, hopefully 20 years from now, we'll still be working together. Um, some of the other, uh, you know, that's what insurance is all about. It is long term planning, insurance is about stability, it is about those th that type of approach. Other jurisdictions, you know, they, they don't have as large local populations, they have to bring in expats from overseas. Uh, you know, somebody may come and stay for five years and then move on, so they're not going to have quite the same history and stickiness with your captive that we would have in Barbados. Um, and that leads me to the other point, you know, bringing in expat staff also comes at a much higher cost. And that needs to be considered too, because obviously you have to relocate people um, that are used to being paid London or New York or Toronto salaries, as well as their family to Barbados and put them up in a house and, and all the other perks that come with it. So that can drive up costs in other jurisdictions compared to Barbados. So, you know, we're not trying to be cheaper or more cost competitive, but it is just an offshoot of that larger local population. And okay. although we, sorry, although I was just going to finish, although we do have local talent, Barbados immigration is quite welcoming and it's relatively easy to get um, the work permit for foreign staff. Thanks a lot, Darren. Yes, thanks, Justin. Okay, so moving on under the 
discussion of the domicile, we'd like to introduce Gabriel Holschneider to, to speak a little bit about the Latin American perspective. Gabriel works closely with Latin American captive owners and just really, I guess, his experience with Latam and Barbados. Gabriel, go ahead. Hello, hello. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, I see that there, that there is 57 participants. I don't see a roster of names so that I could greet some of you. Uh, but I, I wish you are all well and healthy. And sorry for the lack of video. Uh, we're sparing you for look, from looking at our ugly mugs, but it was a last minute technical thing. Um, so Justin did a stellar job at describing, I'm not gonna go into, the, into the, the strengths of all the points he raised, but each of them are worthy of reflection when you wanna set up a captive. Uh, I will like to, as per the Latin American perspective, I'd like to hone in on a couple of them. I think that without a doubt, one of something that makes Barbados truly unique is the strong international legal framework of their treaty structure. This is something that for many, many years now has, has positioned Barbados in a very unique position uh, uh, to capture uh, the interest of business owners that of course, touching on all the other solid points that Justin mentioned, the economic stability, uh, uh, the, the robust governance with the reasonable and, and with a counterweight of reasonable uh, uh, decision making and quick access to decision makers. Uh, but what, what is really driving the difference for a lot of the Latin American players is the fact that this treaty structure enables them to come to a jurisdiction where they find that balance, but more importantly, they are also compliant with their other requirements in whatever country of origin they sit in. And, and uh, this is something that uh, clearly from a Mexican perspective has had a lot of value from, a, from an Argentinian perspective, from a Guatemala perspective. Uh, and, and so we've seen, uh, and, and many other countries. So uh, when you talk about captive insurance, it's inevitable to listen and lean into the owners uh, to understand what it takes for them from a from a corporate uh, planning structure to achieve their goals and uh, this has a lot of weight and and this is one of the key elements of why Barbados in my opinion is ahead of the curve uh, as far as the Latin American general framework is concerned so that is something that is that is uh, extremely positive and valuable great Another thanks yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Gabriel. Just yeah, wrap it up. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I, that was that was, I guess, the, the 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 most important points. I think Justin touched on all the on all the logical ones. Okay. Um, and in wrapping up this particular part of the call, we're going to finish off with Nicholas Critchlow. He'll speak a little bit about the Canadian perspective. Nicholas, before you start, I just want to remind everyone if they have any questions, they could put go to slido.com hashtag captive review and put their questions at any time during the webinar and we'll be having a Q&A um, session at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to send your questions to slido.com. All right, so kicking over to, to Nicholas, just wrap up on the domicile considerations and, and from a Canadian perspective, what, what do you see? Thank you, Justin. Certainly, um, Canada and Canadian captives have been a pivotal um, part in the landscape for insurance um, captives in Barbados um, of the 296 companies um, that are registered at June 30th, 145 of those have Canadian parents. The reflections on Canadian growth certainly goes back to way back when we started our captive industry in Barbados around 1986 or so, and that was started by the uh, tax treaties that continue to prove an important part of the um, relationship between Barbados and Canada. But on building on that over the years, the Barbadian service providers have developed a very good understanding of the minor management concepts which are important for Canadian companies. In addition to that, there is or there are a number of Canadian banks here on the island which creates the, the um, relationship um, between captives, service providers, and certainly being able to find a local account that a captive can open, um, can open a bank account with. Um, and certainly there are, there are matters such as um, um, stability that was mentioned before but one thing that i'll just mention very briefly is the fact that there is also some very excellent weather um, at most times that 
companies decide to have at least one of their board meetings between January and, and, and um, April. And that certainly has been very attractive from a, a, a perspective of having companies here to do their board meetings around that time. All in all, Canada continues to be very pivotal so far for this year of the 70 captives that we have had registered, um, six of them were from Canada. And Gabriel, you will be also happy to know that seven of them were actually from Latin America. So we are seeing some growth still between Canada and Latin America. That's great. Thanks, Nicholas. So yeah, that's a very good summary of the domicile in terms of what to consider when looking at Barbados. Uh, to get a little bit more granular, uh, we're going to talk about one of the specific things about Barbados is the need for substance. Um, and for that, I'd like to kick back to Justin Cole, who will talk about the Substance Act and what that is for Barbados. Go ahead, Justin. Sure, Darren. Thank you. So in terms of economic substance, just to give everyone a background in case they're not familiar with it before I get into to more details, um, you know, this idea of economic substance has come about as a result of international efforts by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, otherwise known as the OECD, as part of their base erosion and profit shifting initiative, which may also be called BEPS. Um, and what this means is that all low tax or no tax jurisdictions and certainly all of those in the Caribbean, including our competitors. So this is not just um, applicable to Barbados, but it's applicable to other um, jurisdictions that have lower no tax. I've all had to enact economic substance legislation. Um, so what this means is that all of these jurisdictions now must have mine and management in the jurisdiction where the insurance company is set up in order for these companies to benefit from these lower tax rates. As Nicholas, spoke about a bit earlier, the Barbados insurance sector has always prided itself on being a jurisdiction of substance with mind and management on the ground. Uh, this was very much always a consideration for the Canadian companies coming here. So Barbados is very used to this. And uh, to be honest, I think as a country, we have by and large welcomed the BEPS initiative as it fits with our existing model. Um, and as I said earlier, we have the local talent on the ground. So to, to us, this just builds on it. Now, let me get a bit more into what the legislation actually says, um, just for the listeners that um, you know haven't gone through it and, and want to know a bit more about what this means exactly. So I'm just going to read the legislation here quickly for you, and um, I'll, I'll try and make it as quick as possible. A resident company meets the economic substance test in relation to the relevant activity carried on by the company, where it conducts its core income generating activities in Barbados and the company is directed, managed, and controlled in Barbados in relation to that activity. A resident company conducts its core income act generating activities in Barbados in circumstances where, having regard to the level of income derived from the relevant activity carried on, A, there is an adequate number of qualified full-time employees in relation to that activity in Barbados, B, there is an adequate number of employees who are all physically present in Barbados in relation to that activity, C, there is an adequate operating expenditure incurred in Barbados, and D, there's an, there are adequate physical act assets in Barbados. So I just wanted to say two things about that. You'll realize that they use the word adequate a lot. They have to use the word adequate because obviously each um, captive and each company uh, beyond just even insurance is unique. So what is suitable a number of employees or a number of people for a particular company may not be the same for another one. And as such, it has to be scaled, and we have to use the word adequate to describe it. The other thing that it has seen mentioned is it mentions full-time employees. But when you go a bit more uh, into detail into what the app mentions, you can also outsource this. So you don't necessarily have to have an employee uh, hiring a captive insurance management company to fulfill those four points that I made above is also satisfactory. And I just want to go a bit further to say the this economic substance test is satisfied where, and again, I'm reading from the act, A, the board of directors of the company hold meetings in Barbados at an adequate frequency, having regard to the amount of decision-making required at that level, and where there is a quorum of directors physically present in Barbados. The minutes of the board meetings are holding a record and Sorry, let me read that again. The minutes of the board meetings refer to in paragraph A, record the making of strategic decisions of the company at the meeting. C, the directors of the company have the necessary knowledge and expertise to, the char to discharge the duties of the board. And D, the minutes of all board meetings and records of the company are kept in Barbados. 
So you can see that this is talking about having people on the ground, having a board of directors um, physically present in Barbados. This can obviously be satisfied. I mentioned earlier local talent. There are lots of experienced insurance executives in Barbados that can sit on your board and they, they will add a lot of value to your company. And in addition, the expectation is, is that directors from overseas will travel to Barbados to attend the meeting in order to make up that quorum uh, where they're enough not physically already present in Barbados. So these are all, um, you know, in terms of economic substance, this is stuff that if you've worked in Barbados before, if you've had a company in Barbados before, you know that, you know, we're very well equipped as a uh, profession and as an industry to satisfy these requirements anyhow. Um, and therefore that is, you know, it's another reason in the in new world and the direction that um, international sec centers are going uh, that, you know, Barbados is a strong choice once again. Great, thanks, no Justin. No so problem. maybe um, as we are talking about substance and, and what that means in terms of the legislation, maybe Nicholas, you could expand a little bit on that in terms of really maybe focusing on some of the practical con practical considerations that someone who's considering a, a captive or forming a captive in Barbados, like what does that really mean in terms of practic practicality and, and what do they have to implement to satisfy those substance rules? So Nicholas, if you could speak to that, please. Sure, thanks, Justin. Thanks, Darian. I often tell my, my clients now that um, what we have been doing from a management perspective, certainly a Canadian management or Catholic perspective, is we have been meeting the general requirements of substance. From a practical perspective, we often have a majority of non-Canadian resident directors um, as the directors for the Barbers captives, which means that Traditionally, they have been able to have a quorum of local directors in Barbados, even if the Canadian residents or Canadian directors cannot attend. Um, the majority of, of captives certainly would have a majority of non-Canadian resident directors. And therefore, from a practical perspective, we would be telling our clients to continue to source uh, qualified uh, directors who as Justin mentioned, have the appropriate qualifications to direct the business of the captives here on the island. I think we are certainly in a very, very good position as it relates to, to this matter. We, the substance requirements just requires that we file certain um, returns at the end of each year. But I think from a practical perspective, um, we are going to be able to advise our clients uh, how to meet those requirements with respect to directorship, with respect to what they need to do in Barbados. And um, I think most management companies certainly have the experience in order to um, guide and to direct the clients accordingly. But beyond what Justin's quoted, um, there's not too much more with respect to uh, the practical uh, applications uh, other than the fact that we will be able to provide directors, we will be able to guide, and we will we'll be able to ensure that all the requirements are met. Great, thanks, Nicholas. Uh, and just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can go to slido.com, hashtag captive review, and, and post your questions there. So now I'd like to turn the floor over to, to Gabriel to speak a little bit about, about to speak about the emerging opportunities that he's seeing from the LATAM area um, when it comes to Barbados captives. And, and we spoke earlier in the in the intro about hard market cycle, ongoing pandemic, emergence of, of new risks. So Gabriel, maybe you could speak specifically about what you're seeing in relation to your LATAM, LATAM clients in terms of I, why I'm the glad, glad to do so, Darren. But uh, the perfect segue is to just uh, touch upon what my colleagues said in the need for substance. Never before has substance been so important in today's uh, complex, changing, fast-paced uh, IFRS, CRS, uh, uh, GATCA, FATCA. It's all about substance, and substance is a two-sided coin. So I feel very proud of Barbados for laying out a very broad canvas where the minimum requirements of, of minimum requirements of substance are strong and solid, but it really gives the client latitude to go above and beyond those requirements because, as I said, being a two-sided coin, we always focus on what the not what the client needs locally alone locally meaning Barbados, but what the client needs to ensure they are doing 
in their in their operations domestically to make the process seamless through and through so the matter of substance has a, a lot of relevance and now i segue directly into the ask of what i'm seeing in latam being a brand new market with with flourishing opportunities with a little consolidation you find yourself amongst many privately held very large family-owned corporations some of them are very sophisticated already and very successful regionally or even locally in, in their in their territories and they have experience with international business so they know how to walk the walk and talk the talk of an international organization when it comes to insurance it's a strong education process from the ground up with the client of opening their eyes to the to the wonders of self-insurance but as you as you walk with them in that process it goes way beyond just rate online hard or soft market it really has to do with their overarching corporate and risk management strategy uh, and this is why back to the issue that that justin and nick were sharing on substance is adamant because we want clients in Barbados and we want to entertain corporations that want to go above and beyond the compromise and the, the commitment to their enterprise risk management. And it starts with the operating company and it ends with a very robust, sound uh, 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 operation, uh, in this case in Barbados. Because uh, these, these companies are set up for long-term vision and they need to stand the test of time. And, and that test isn't always just the test that is imparted locally in Barbados, but it's also the test that they are subject to for being in the international landscape. And working in a jurisdiction like Barbados, I think, has a very broad canvas that, that, can, that can afford that. So on the emerging opportunities in LATAM, I would say look at all the strong verticals that have for years built the captive insurance industry globally, the automobile industry, the steel industry, all the distribution, food and beverage industry. All of these industries exist and are prolific in Latin America, and many of them have never had the opportunity to understand the virtues of self-insurance. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. There are many opportunities, but I just, uh, we pride ourselves on really owning the process from the ground up and being super transparent with the clients of their merits and the commitments that having a captive entails. Um, but we're seeing a lot of traction in all the jurisdictions except for Venezuela. Over. Great, thanks Gabriel, that's very interesting. Now, in terms of new risks emerging and, and opportunities that are, are facing the market now, maybe Nicholas, you can speak a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of other emerging opportunities across kind of the wider captive space. Sure, thanks, Darren. As you would appreciate, captives and the fundamental, um, one fundamental basis for captives is the fact that there may be risk that is difficult to insure or the risk that is being insured is being priced a lot higher than the actual risk in the owner's opinion merits. And there are two lines of business in particular that seems to meet those criteria, which has resulted in an increase in traction with respect to growth and the use of captives for writing these risks. One of the um, risks that I'll mention this morning relates to cyber insurance. Within the last year, year over year, there's 30% growth in the number of captives writing cyber. You may ask the question, why? There's been a 35% increase in cyber insurance pricing in the US and approximately 25% in the UK. So again, the prices of this insurance has increased significantly year over year. Many leading insurance companies have also begun to limit their exposure to ransomware losses. And as a result of that, restrictions in coverage, as well as the increase in pricing, it creates the perfect opportunity for captive use. What we are seeing is that within the healthcare 
captives, 19% of them write cyber. And that's followed by financial institutions and the retail sector, where approximately 40% of those captives write cyber. So why use a captive for cyber? Certainly, the use of a captive can provide for tailored coverage for excluded coverages. So as I mentioned, some companies are no longer allowing uh, or writing ransomware in their policies, and therefore, a captive can be an ideal uh, vehicle to write specialized coverages for a spirit company. In addition to that, there are also coverages that can be included in the captive, including emerging risks such as cyber terrorism. As you all would appreciate, um, the ability to write a, use a captive to write cyber um, creates an opportunity that you can use the captive for reassurance access. And there's also the cost benefit of the captive, as well as the fact that you're reducing your dependence on third party insurance companies. The other um, line of coverage, which I'll mention, relates to DNO insurance. Again, some of our clients are seeing pricing that has multiplied or double, and it sometimes tripled over the last year because of the difficulty to get DNO coverage. Um, in this case, there are um, a couple of um, clauses within the traditional DNO policy. CITE uh, provides insurance for wrongful acts of directors and officers um, that is not permitted to be reimbursed by the um, by the company or in some cases where due to bankruptcy the company is unable to actually pay for that um, reimbursement to the directors site b and site c insurance provides coverage directly for the um, uh, um, company in many other regards but with respect to site a coverage um, what we are seeing is that some companies are using segregated cell uh, vehicles to write the, the DNO coverage in those vehicles because they could not use that for their own, or they cannot write the CIDA coverage in their own single parent captives. Um, in those cases, what we are seeing is that the, the company capitalizes the, uh, the cell uh, for the full limit of the potential loss, uh, which can be very significant, but they also benefit from the significant savings that are afforded by using the, the the uh, circuited cell company for those uh, types of coverages. With respect to site B and site C coverages, um, some companies are using the, the their own single parent captives to write those coverages. And again, the capitalization is significant, but certainly it provides for the benefit of reduced costs um, on the over the long and medium term. So as I mentioned, with respect to DNO and cyber, we are seeing a significant increase in captives being utilized for those coverages. And it's all as a result of the increase in cost and the fact that some of the coverages are being tailored or being um, reduced by the friend insurance companies um, and therefore a captive becomes very useful in those circumstances. Great, thanks Nicholas. Um, and just to wrap this up, Justin, I don't know if you want to add anything here. Um, you know, obviously we, we've, we've heard about emerging opportunities, um, but also Barbados is, is well experienced to deal with more traditional lines of insurance as well. I don't know if you have any comments in terms of you know, what typical risk you might see uh, in a Barbados captive being insured. Yeah, Darren, I mean, I would just say in general, in Barbados, there are no restrictions on the type of insurance business that can be written. So, you know, we see a wide range of everything from PNC to health insurance, life insurance, uh, professional indemnity insurance. Uh, what I would just say is the general opportunity, I think, um, you know, both ourselves at DGM as well as the other captive managers in Barbados and probably in other jurisdictions too. I, I think we would have had a, a busy 2020 to 2021 as the hardening insurance market, which we have uh, spoken about, has um, been occurring and it has been driving a lot of risk managers um, to kind of pull the trigger on making that decision to move forward with a captive. You know, of, of, of Often people will think about these things, discuss them, and there's some hesitation to go forward. But I think with that hardening market now, uh, you're seeing a lot of action being taken. And um, th there's definitely been an increase in captive formation over the last two years as a result. Great, thank you for that. All right, as we move along, um, the next area we wanna cover is lessons from the pandemic. So uh, we've all experienced the pandemic in one form or another. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about it or mentioned it 
previously here on on the on this webinar. But um, I'd like to, I guess, get a little bit more detailed and, and have maybe Gabriel, if you could speak to some some pandemic related uh, lessons that you're seeing when it comes to captive insurance and, and how Barbados deals with it, or just your experiences with the pandemic and what's that meant to you in terms of finding you know captive solutions. Well, glad to do so. Uh, to Justin's point, uh, not only the pandemic, but the hard hard market that was you know that we are facing now are tremendous opportunities for any of you interested in, in not only building a captive, but if you're in the business of trying to serve a client and, and you're in the broking side or you're in the management side, this is truly a, a great market for, for building and growing captives in. Uh, number one, uh, uh, as Justin points out, the, the, the hens came home to roost and uh, and managers and business owners are witnessing firsthand if I would have had my vehicle ready, if I would have had a place to park the risk, if I would have had optionality. And Barbados is amazing for that because one of one of uh, uh, Justin's great points at the beginning is, you know, it's not it's not a, a massive economic investment to get up and running in Barbados. And many clients who who bang their head against the wall that wish they would have had that optionality when 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 the crux of the pandemic and and uh, the hard market set in. Uh, that said, um, clients are reluctant to pay the markets uh, in general. They're more reluctant to pay the markets when the markets react the way they are now, and they are less reluctant to pay themselves and bear the risk on a balance sheet created ex profeso for that matter. So, so great time to be uh, advising clients or helping clients on their captive strategy. At, on the pandemic uh, itself, we have seen and we are encouraging increased uh, self-retention on actual pandemic risk, depending on which of the uh, business sectors we're, we're engaging. But I can give you an example for ex uh, of a client that is very active in, in uh, food and beverage. And uh, we're encouraging them, encouraging them to, to retain uh, a pandemic risk that uh, serves uh, much like a business interruption would. And their books have the scars and the wounds to demonstrate the substance behind the coverage. And, and it's demonstrating to be a very powerful tool for them to protect against that. And obviously, having the ability to walk with your client or with the insured and also helping them set uh, reasonable limits and also helping them protect against uh, uh, with catastrophic protection on top of their retentions uh, just makes it all the more exciting to be able to to take advantage of this situation. If you all recall, in 2008, there was a large pandemic that broke out that uh, struck some of the Latin American territories called the, uh, I believe it was the NI1 or the N1H1 pandemic. And we have a couple of clients who back then were impacted, not as severely as now, but that are, as a result of that, decided to, under, to, to embed a pandemic cover for their operations. Well, lo and behold, almost 10 years later, you can imagine how much uh, uh, um, uh, relief they felt when they were able to claim on that. And the pandemic is here to stay, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, COVID-19, there will be a 20 and a 21 and a 22, and this is something we will learn to live with moving forward. So helping clients understand the virtues of self-insurance around not only pandemic risk, but also uh, the, the benevolent aspect of having that you own your destiny when it comes to risk management, is something that is readily available now and that all of you should go and try and seize with your clients or as clients yourselves. Wow, that's great, Gabriel. That's really insightful. Um, maybe, Nicholas, would you like to add something to that in terms of the lessons from the pandemic? What have you experienced or what have you seen? Well, I certainly would just like to add that from a, a, a pandemic perspective and reiterate, well, not reiterate, but to add that um, um, what we are seeing definitely are some companies that are attempting to write pandemic risk. So I think Gabriel is totally correct with respect to the Latin American perspective, um, but it certainly um, extends to other um, um, other parts of the world as well, where uh, it, 
is becoming of very high interest with respect to to the number of um, pandemic um, captives that are being formed or or additional risks that are being written in captives related to the pandemic risk. Um, I think generally speaking, we, we continue to see a hardened market as well, but I think um, certainly from an electronic perspective, we continue to, to ensure that clients are serviced. And as was mentioned earlier, um, Barbis continues to have the type of infrastructure and the type of um, um, capabilities to ensure that notwithstanding the pandemic issues, we are able to continue to service our clients and any captives that are managed here on the island. Great. Okay. Uh, Justin, anything there you'd like to add in terms of lessons from the pandemic? Yeah, sure. I can cover a couple of things. I, I think at a very high level, um, obviously, wording on business interruption insurance and whether that includes pandemic coverage or not is uh, going to be heavily scrutinized going forward. Um, where it may not have been taken as seriously before, or considered as seriously before, now that we know the damage and the costs, um, everybody will want to know whether they're covered or the insurers that do not want to cover, cover it will make sure it is um, clearly excluded so that there is no um, ambiguity going forward, given what has taken place and the incredible costs. Um, some of the other benefit. What, what I'll speak to from in terms of lessons from the pandemic is some of the benefits that I've seen some of our captive owners um, have, or or some of the things to maybe look out for. Um, I mean, we have seen one captive that was able to offer its members uh, things like premium reductions during the pandemic. So obviously, that was a an economic benefit that you know. The, the captive was able to give back. And while those things, you know, where Gabriel was talking about people having the captives in place prior to the hard market. Uh, so that was something that they could be thankful that they had done. Um, in addition to, you know, the, the rise in prices elsewhere. So not only did they have their rates locked in, but they were able to actually get a premium refund. So that, that's a good one. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that, sure, while captives may cover a certain amount of claims and certain costs. The other thing that the pandemic has kind of opened up is sometimes it may have a admin fee per claim attached to it. And, you know, once again, when you don't live in a pre-pandemic world, we don't expect, um, you know, the fallout that we have seen. And in this case, if those admin costs don't have a, a cap or anything like that, they can actually get uh, quite high. So clauses like that and things like that in the post-pandemic world, I think uh, people now have to pay much closer attention to because this is not a far off dream that you know probably will never happen. This is something that's happened and, and people have got hit hard by it. So you know we need to keep our eyes on those details. And just as a final point, uh, depending on how the captive is set up and you know the position of the shareholder, you know, if a captive is, say, maybe for a professional association that doesn't have a shareholder sitting on lots of additional capital to recapitalize it, the pandemic has definitely brought to light the, the benefit of having additional capital held within the captive uh, for these scenarios. Because obviously, you know, the insurance market and the point of a captive is, is, you know, for the long term, it is for stability. And you don't want an event like this to come along and wipe you out. So, for people that took a more conservative approach and said, you know, we're going to keep extra capital beyond what the actuaries are recommending just in case, uh, we've seen that pay off in that that was, you know, that has proven to be the right decision and has kept them safe and protected where you don't have to now go out and uh, drastically increase premiums. And you can actually almost continue on as before because you've kept, kept that extra capital there for a rainy day. So that's about it for me and what I've seen. Okay, great. All right, so we're probably going to be moving on to the Q&A, and, and I'm sure that's going to bring on a lot more um, interesting points of discussion. Um, so just a reminder, if you have any questions, go to slido.com, hashtag captive review, and put your question there, and hopefully we'll be able to address it. Uh, but before we move on to the questions, I'd just like to, to have another little icebreaker here, a little joke, and hopefully uh, maybe we have some actuaries on the, on the webinar today that we'll, we'll find this funny. How many actuaries would it take to change one light bulb? It depends on how many it took last year. So any actuaries out there, hopefully you found that amusing. All right, so as, uh, as I said, we're ready to move on to the Q&A. So if there's any questions um, lined up, Renata, perhaps you can, or 
someone can um, come with the first question. Hey, Darren, I believe that the questions would soon be posted onto the screen, but I can share the first one received from you. Um, and it's right there. From a practical financial and tax perspective, how can Barbados be attractive to set up a captive for LATAM companies which are subject to CFC rules? Okay, this sounds like a question that lines up well for Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, would you like to attempt to, to take on that question? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, at the heart of this is uh, something that has very little to do with insurance and has everything to do with uh, the interested party being fully compliant, of course, in their local territory, which is where the advice begins, right? To make sure that you're always walking down, walking with your clients down a very straight path that uh, uh, keeps them out of trouble and keeps us in business. So um, to answer what are the impacts for a particular case, for a particular LATAM company with CFC rules, well, there's many questions that you should be asking your client from where are you, where are you domiciled, what your residence is, and, and what does your corporate structure look like, and let alone your, your, your own structure. And having the, the ability to, to have uh, access to that uh, that situation, you're in a better position to then uh, uh, assess what the best path for that particular client may be. So uh, that's why back to the point that we touched on, on the, on, we have to be adamant on substance because in the end, when it's all said and done, CFC and any other rule will be subject to interpretation. And if that interpretation goes in X or Y direction, if we were clear and, and, and responsible on the side of substance, there is nothing to fear from the client or from us as managers or from, or from Barbados as a, as a domicile. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated question to address with a simple answer. The answer I would give is, it's not only about insurance, it's about understanding the enterprise and the and the ultimate beneficial owner's overarching strategy and to helping them walk a straight line. Over. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right, uh, the next question I see here is predictions for the future of captives in Barbados. Again, I'll open it up to the panelists. Anyone wanna take a, uh, a stab at this one? Obviously, uh, we wanna see what your crystal ball has to say and then what your thoughts are in terms of the future. Um, open the floor to the panelists. Anyone want to step in and take it? Sure, I can, um, I can make um, <clears throat> some comments on that and I'll probably relate it to the um, subsequent question because I think they probably go hand in hand because what happens with respect to the global tax will also um, impact in the short term with what happens with respect to captives um, going forward. But certainly based on the growth that we have been seeing this year, 17 companies, as I mentioned, up to June 30th, um, I believe that by the end of this year, we'll probably have a record number. Um, I certainly think that the growth of captives in Barbados will continue to be strong. Um, there were six or seven um, LATAM companies, and I believe that that will continue to, to, to show growth. I also believe that there will continue to be growth all of, um, all of Canada as Barbados continues to push both in Latin America as well as the Canadian market. Um, I don't see that the, the abatement of the hard market happening anytime soon, and therefore I certainly predict that we will continue to gain or, or maintain our share of new capitalist formations in the uh, in the world. Um, certainly, that will be impacted with respect to the the uh, the war tax or the single tax issue. And um, I think it should also be remembered, however, that companies are not only formed because of tax reasons; they are also formed because of genuine insurance purposes. And having looked at a number of the captives that we manage, certainly a number of captives or the reasons why captives are formed, I can see that um, despite the war tax um, provision, um, companies will still find captives a useful way to fund their various um, insurances, whether it's the, the new um, insurance, as I mentioned before, cyber and DNO, or whether it be the traditional type of insurance. But I do see that irrespective of what happens in the future, that captives will continue to grow 
um, um, going forward. Okay. I'll just jump in. Darren, if you don't mind, just echo some of Nicholas's thoughts. I mean, I, I agree with him 100% on strong growth, that's for sure. In terms of this global minimal, minimum tax app, you know, Nicholas did mention, you know, the primary reason captives are not set up is, not, is really about risk management rather than tax. However, you have to remember, um, big picture, that this global minimum tax is really um, going in place to go after massive companies. I mean, we're talking about companies like Facebook, Amazon, where, um, for example, the Europeans are very much trying to collect sales tax and, and those type of countries. As such, this global minimal tax, I don't even think applies to companies with, I think it's 750 million in, I can't remember if it's revenues, I think it's revenues. Anyway, it's a very large number. And I think a lot of financial services companies and, and um, a lot of the captives we see in Barbados, to be honest, they're not even gonna meet that threshold. So to us um, sitting here in Barbados looking at this, it is not a major consideration. It is not something that we are concerned about. We really think that by the time it plays out, uh, I can't predict what, how it's gonna end, but I don't think it's gonna have uh, much of an effect and it. it's definitely not something that we are overly concerned about, uh, but we'll keep our eye on it. Absolutely agree from a Latin perspective, it's, it's not on the top of our list. Okay, very interesting, yes. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Captives and healthcare, correlation and status welcome. Um, does someone want to speak to that? Well, from, from there's clearly, um, especially in the US economy with the uh, ever-changing landscape in, in the healthcare space, we continue to see uh, the growth for, for and demand for captives, especially in the medical stop loss uh, segments, which is a massive, massive growing market. Um, from so, so for the U.S. playbook of captives, and still you would be surprised how many of those clients are uh, uh, making the decision to take their business outside of the U.S. Uh, domiciles into domiciles like Barbados, uh, which is very encouraging. But that is a focus and a lens that uh, that's, that's proven and 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 well known uh, within the U.S. market, and it is growing uh, uh, in a very important manner. As far as the Latin American perspective on utilization of captives for for uh, healthcare, we've seen less of that because of the ability of local carriers to really provide a strong, good local. Uh, retentions uh, at good decent local prices still so uh, I haven't come across in my walk of many captive opportunities that stem from the healthcare space in the Latin American framework but we are seeing uh, an increase and an uptick in the US market which is massive in that space okay um, looks like the next question is for Justin um, would he be briefly Explain the competitive advantages Barbados has and what it needs to do urgently. Thank you, Hallam Hope. Thank you, Hallam, for the question. Justin, feel free. I see my good friend Hallam um, is asking a pointed question direct to that at me. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Hallam. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of competitive advantages for Barbados, I mean, I, I would state the number one thing is once again, it's people, um, you know, the qualifications of the, the people here and the dedication to the industry. Um, in terms of what it needs to do urgently, I mean, we I, th I think we all um, have said it, I want to keep pushing for you know increased business facilitation, and I would say with the government, uh, the new government that came in about two to three years ago, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen major steps for digitization in some areas, and I know our corporate registry is about to go digital now, and um, there, there's a lot of promise and hope there and if that's rolled out like some of the other things that have been rolled out digitally uh, it is you know it is day and night in terms of the improvements so you know i'd, I'd like to hope that continues those efforts continue to um to to, to be capitalized to, to evolve um, for us to see the the benefits and fruits of of what has been put in in the background and barbados has huge potential you know just to to give all the professional staff and all of us the, the opportunity to better serve our clients. And as things continue to improve and, and continue on this trajectory, I think it's only good things to come, to be honest. I'm very positive about the future. 
Great. Would any other panelists like to to echo on any of Justin's competitive advantages, or maybe add some additional ones that they feel are are worth noting? Speed, knowledge, flexibility. That's all I've gotten from Barbados. Okay. Great. Okay, moving on. Uh, there's a question about ESG. Obviously, ESG has been a very hot topic uh, of late, so uh, I'll read the question and let the panelists get to it. Has ESG become an open discussion item and a more relevant factor in Barbados? Anybody want to start off with that? I mean, I, I, I'll add a little bit into that since uh, as an asset management company, London and Capital, uh, we, we do see ESG uh, requirements coming from the various, some various captives that, that we are involved with. Uh, definitely when it comes to prospective clients and, 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 and pitches, uh, ESG is, is usually asked about. Um, so there definitely is, um, a more, it is a more relevant factor in Barbados, but it is, I guess, unique to the actual captive and, and, and what their investment object, objectives are. Um, but again, within Barbados itself, the asset managers are, are well equipped to, to deal with ESG concerns when it comes to the, the investments. I'll just say, I mean, to be honest, I haven't seen anything directly in terms of the, the captives or anything that we deal with, but I would just add and just say a thank you to a lot of the captives and clients that are set up here is that they're very good corporate citizens in terms of donating to the community, to charities, uh, even to COVID relief and funds for vaccines and things like that. Um, you know, we have exceptional companies that have set up in Barbados and really give back. So while maybe not uh, specific in that regard, uh, they've done a lot for the island and we appreciate it. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's an interesting one. Bermuda versus Barbados, pros and cons. Uh, and a lot of times people confuse one with the other. Sometimes people call Barbados Bermuda and vice versa. So we are two different islands uh, and very different um, characteristics. So maybe if someone has any familiarity with Bermuda um, versus Barbados, maybe we can speak to that briefly. Go ahead, panelists. So hands down Barbados, and I do a lot of business in Bermuda, hands down Barbados. You get everything Bermuda offers, but the speed and the comprehension and, and the ability to understand and, and be reasonable around a specific project, the bespoke elements that Barbados awards, good luck in Bermuda. So, um, and, and I, I have a lot of love for Bermuda and I do great with my business there, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, getting very big and very complex. Yeah, I think um, certainly, um, as was mentioned earlier, certainly from a Canadian perspective, um, Barbados has um, significant advantages. Um, uh, as um, Justin mentioned, the, the, um, the treaty, even though the Kia exists in Bermuda, I think the treaty, um, is, also, is, is still a more robust um, form. Um, we are um, um, certainly uh, a simple jurisdiction with respect to the insurance regulations, um, class one. Um, I still think that in a lot of cases, um, they can be used in a way that may not be the same as in Bermuda. Um, and I think generally speaking, um, um, Barbados still has um, the type of infrastructure that is comparable to any other jurisdiction anywhere. And therefore, when you add all the positives together, um, certainly um, it creates a very compelling environment for any um, captive consideration. Okay, interesting. So we have two more questions here. Um, I think we need to move through them quickly so we can wrap up in, 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 in within the hour. We're probably going to be slightly, maybe five minutes more than the hour, if that's okay, if everyone can just hang on. Um, so. Quickly, if we can just speak to this next question, describe the main differences you are experiencing pre-pandemic to now. Um, go ahead and, and please keep it brief. Uh, I'll be brief and I'll address the second one. Uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> working remote, working remote uh, requires a lot of commitment and requires, uh, and I think Barbados has uh, gone the extra mile to adapt to the remote landscape while not uh, uh, losing the rigor of, uh, of putting faces behind names and 
and making sure that uh, we stay compliant. Um, so it has the typical challenges you would attach to any other industry, but Barbados has stepped up to the plate on staying open and active and growing. From a LATAM standpoint, our activity is done mostly in local currency or in dollars. Both, um, you can have the, some clients opt to liquidate their local uh, uh, policies in their local currency, and then there's a conversion effect, and some choose to just, uh, depending on which country, to issue in dollars and just keep it all dollarized. So you have both alternatives. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thank you, Gabriel. Anybody else want to talk about differences pre and post? Okay, with that, let's just move on to the wrap up. Um, before we do, I'm gonna close off with one final joke. And I think Renata, if you don't mind doing the closing remarks after. Um, so as I depart, I'll leave you with one final funny thought. Uh, what did the insurance salesman say when a man asked whether he could get any insurance if a volcano near his house erupted? The agent assured him that he would be covered. Okay, with that, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining the, the webinar today. Uh, Renata, did you want to close or would you like me to go ahead and close? Uh, no, I, do. I really just wanted to, to thank everyone um, who have joined us online for the session and to thank yourself as moderator. Thoroughly appreciated um, the humor that was infused today and to thank our speakers who have contributed immensely and provided great insights and food for thought. The Invest Barbados team is available, as mentioned, to be guides for anyone considering Barbados. And I think you have presented wonderful reasons as to why. So thank you very much, Darren. Okay. Again, yeah, I'd like to reiterate, thank you very much to the panelists. Very knowledgeable, um, very um, good people to work with. So if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to them directly. Um, they would be, they'll be more than appreciative to help. So. Um, thank you again, panelists, for your insight and sharing some of your experiences with us. Thank you.